Hi y'all, Miss B here, and um, hopefully everyone is doing great. Uh, things are going well for you. If not going well, they're headed in that direction. You're shaking, moving, rattling, and doing the things you need to do to get them well. In this episode, I wanted to talk about um, the importance of following your spirit. Uh, and again, for those of you who don't remember, uh, I was raised Baptist Christian. And uh, although I continue to evolve, a lot of my um, references will be from that perspective only because, um, though there may be some questions on the religion overall, the, some of the foundations, some of the um, lessons, some of the pearls and gems are, are still valid no matter what your faith and so um, I hold on to those regardless of my faith and my spiritual journey, uh, especially those that seem to serve me and serve me well. Even if I don't like it, they still are serving me. So um, I was there thinking and uh, I felt it necessary to do this just because um, some people have asked me, you know, how do you know when to do certain things or how do you know when to stop something? Or how do you know when the time is right for various things? And um, what I usually say is you've got to follow your spirit. You've got to um, be in tune with your spirit. And biblically, uh, we know um, God says, you know, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. Uh, and so I use that same concept. Your spirit, if you've spent enough time meditating, um, communing with the God that you serve, then you will know when that God is speaking to you. And oftentimes they speak through your spirit, if you will. Um, they may speak through other people, animals, images, uh, you know, you can be driving down the street and then they just drop it in your, in, inside your, in your ears, if you will. It may be, um, you know, you're reading the newspaper. Well, who reads the newspaper these days because we're all online. But you might be reading a newspaper and uh, something that you've been meditating on for the last week or so and the answer is right smack on the front page. Or it could be, you know, on the back page, in the middle of the sports section, wherever it is. But you have to be um, in commune, and you have to be open and ready to receive. And, of course, the timing has to be right and all that other good stuff. But um, just wanted to give you a few examples of that. One of the first things I did, and didn't really even realize what I was doing, but I, in my health journey, I did some cleansing. And so I was detoxing. And um, I don't say publicly the various methods that I use to detox just because um, I don't necessarily want people to copy them and get themselves in trouble. Uh, you have to know what your health condition is, where you are overall health-wise before you start tinkering with various herbs and um, concoctions and things like that. So I never recommend to anybody publicly across the board, hey, just go do this or just go do that. Oh, let me correct that. I won't say I never, I rarely. There are one or two things that I, I will recommend. I always recommend a multivitamin, a good multivitamin. And then um, the CKLS, the colon, kidney, liver, and spleen um, detox cleanser, I recommend that across the board. But anything beyond that is usually um, a case-by-case -case situation. And so the people that I've worked with or that have come to me for help, I work with them individually. And how I um, have dealt with my health journey is working with it individually. And so, and that's what I was doing. I was on a journey to get my health right. And so I was doing cleanses and detoxes. And I was doing them regularly, just almost daily. Um, and they weren't very um, uh, harsh. It wasn't a matter of you have to sit by the toilet all day, every day, seven days a week. Um, I did those, the, the major ones, if you will, up front. 
and then maintained a very, very, very small dose of the detox protocol that worked for me best on a daily basis. And so what I was doing was removing unnecessary um, trash, if you will, or um, if you're, you're uh, a person who listens to, who does ham radios or any kind of radios, that um, static or that noise, if you will. I was eliminating some of that out of my body so that my, my spirit man um, could be better in tune to receive any particular messaging that it needed to receive. Um, and the other thing I did was I meditated a lot. I studied a lot. I prayed a lot. I asked for guidance a lot. And the more I did that, the more I found that I was getting responses. I was getting answers. I was getting guidance. I was getting um, instruction. I was getting uh, just that guidance. And it came to the point where I made sure I didn't make a major move until my spirit, my inner spirit in me, was comfortable with the move. So, um, those were things that I was doing to to um, advance my health journey, but they also uh, apply in, in this particular situation, following your spirit. And just some examples, some real life examples. As it turns out, um, my daddy just got out of the hospital. Um, I usually don't go home for Thanksgiving. Um, in the last maybe 10, 12 years since I moved way out west, home is, that's, that's a long haul for that short time frame. And, um, we usually drive where we go. We don't fly. My kids don't like to fly. And with all the security stuff going on in the airport, you've got to undress and just, you know, pretty much get down almost naked. Uh, I don't like to fly anymore. So I'll drive. Uh, and, you know, sometimes my health that becomes a challenge trying to drive that short time frame. And the reality is I'm not as young as I used to be. So those 12, 16 hour drives over a three day weekend and turn around and come back, you know, my body can't handle that the way it used to. But, um, yeah, this particular year I had, um, it dropped in my spirit to go home. And uh, I kind of dismissed it a little bit. I'm like, okay, the budget's not where I want it to be. There's some other things I want to do. And, um, yeah, I'll go home for a couple of days. But then uh, I come back, and that's going to throw me off with some plans that I had. So um, I dismissed it. But, you know, it kept riding me. Now nope, go home. And then um, my girls put it out there in the atmosphere. Well, Mom, you know what? We're going home. We want to go home for Thanksgiving. I'm like, okay. And at the same time, I learned an uncle on the other side of the family was coming that I hadn't seen in maybe about seven, eight years, uh, was coming to the city that I'm in now to visit. And, and that was a trip that they'd already planned. So I'm like, okay, we're going to be two ships passing in the night. And I really want to see him. And I told the girls, well, I know he really wants to see you all. He, he was like, he was the first uncle to call when, when they were born. And he was just so excited to see them. And I remember growing up, he was always supportive and um, kept in touch and that sort of thing. But long story short, I made the decision to go home. And uh, was able to spend that time with, with my daddy and my youngest brother and, and um, mom, of course. Uh, and this is. For those of you who know, my biological mother is deceased. This is my adopted family. Um, and my girls, they really enjoyed it. You know, um, my daddy, the girls wanted to uh, improve their, their firearm skills and training. And, um, you know, my daddy kind of challenged them and stuff. And, and they said, well, no, granddaddy, we can do it. And so before you know it, you know, I, I know my dad is well armed. There's not a room in the house that's not covered. But he was pulling out some stuff I didn't even know he had. And then some things go back to his grandmother. 
and had been passed down to him. So it was awesome really to be able to fire um, firearms that had been fired or owned by, let me see, that would be dad, grand, great grand great-grandparents and for my girl's case great-great-grandparents um, it was just really awesome and my daddy took them through the gamut they we went from the smallest of the handguns all the way up to the biggest of the rifles and shotguns and uh, when they got to the last heaviest most powerful thing they were able to pull it so um, I was pretty proud of them and, and they enjoyed it and they enjoyed having that experience with their granddaddy that was something that they wanted, and um, my daddy's health was, was a little challenged. I know he had been down, but um, he and my youngest brother made sure that that, that occurred. And so, um, and we had a great time, just kind of sitting around, just spending time, not doing a whole lot. We went to town maybe, you know, for an hour or so, and then back out in the country. It was just walking the grass and um, feeding the horses and uh, four wheeling and you know all that kind of country stuff. Um, and to show how the what the importance of that was was that you know we came on back and we were settling back in, and um, my girls say to me, "Well, mom, you know, daddy's still in the hospital, but he's doing better." And I said, "What do you mean he's still in the hospital? When when did he get in?" And they said, "Well, you didn't get the text." And I looked, "No, I didn't get the text." And as it turns out, mom had sent out um, an, an SOS, emergency text, if you will, that daddy had to be rushed to the hospital. And he'd already been in there from like the night before. So, um, and immediately I was frustrated. I was frustrated for two reasons. A, because I just left there, uh, you know, what, two weeks ago, and, and do I turn around and go back? But of course, by the time I've tracked down, he sees better now and all of that. So there's no need for me to go back at this point. However, um, the other frustration came from the fact that uh, had I not known um, to go home for Thanksgiving or had I not followed my spirit to go home, I would not have seen um, where he was. I knew he was getting down and I knew there were some health issues because, you know, I know my age, so I know his age. Uh, but... I would have missed that those signs because I was able to discern some things while I was there, so I know what to do going forward. But I didn't realize how soon, um, you know, there might be some issues. And then, you know, to add it all in in, you know, in this process of exposing cultic churches and church abuse and corruption and things like that, uh, my church has. Well, I'm gonna say my church. I'll say someone has taken hold, if you will, has captured my phone number, a number that I've held for almost, you know, 30 years, 25, almost 30 years, and that number was attached to everything in my life, if you will. So um, people who knew me knew to reach me there if they couldn't reach me anywhere else. And I tell you, no matter what's going on in my life, that number was maintained. And so they've, they've taken hold of that number, and they're holding it. Um, just, just so that I can't get it, just to eliminate my contact, just to keep me isolated so that I cannot get communications from people because most people, that is the only way they had to reach me. And at the same time, their physical phone was remotely erased or reset or whatever you want to call it so that it wiped clear all the numbers that were in the phone unit so that I could not turn around and call out. So, um, and I see that as, as, you know, very clearly attempt to isolate, to remove any support because the crap that they're doing, um, it's effective when um, the person, the target is isolated and cannot get help, can't reach out and that sort of thing. But um, I say all that to say I followed my spirit and I was able to spend that time with my daddy and my girls were able to spend that time with their granddaddy. Um, why? Because I broke the mold, if you will. I broke my tradition, if you will, and I went home for Thanksgiving, which is something I really, I usually don't do. Um, another time in which what fell in my spirit was to go home.
again, yet another time to go home. And this home I'm talking about is in the country. This is not New York City home. This is my country home where my adoptive um, parents are. And, and it was really a last minute thing. Again, it was because I usually plan my trips in advance just so I can do all the logistics and get everything squared away and that sort of thing. But um, the girls and I were, were here. Well, not here, but we were at home. We were lived in a different house at the time. And um, I remember uh, one of the ministers at the church saying to me, I'm surprised you're not gone because you usually be gone. And I said, yeah, I'm not going this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang around. And later that evening, I had an inkling to go. And I'm just, okay, wait a minute now. No, I, I just told them I'm going to be here. And, but it rode me and it rode me hard. And so um, I slept on it and I got up the next day and it was still there. And I said, okay, what are you trying to tell me? All right, well, I guess we need to go. So, you know, it doesn't take much to pack a bag. You're going home so you don't have to be cute. You just throw in some jeans and a couple t-shirts. Flip-flops if you need to, otherwise you can buy some at Walmart, grab a toothbrush, some underwear, and you're gone. And that's what we did. Well, as it turned out, uh, we were about halfway there. We'd gone, put in about four or five hours maybe into the drive, and uh, I got a, my phone ring. Um, and that was so awesome about that number that I had and that service that I had. Uh, I'd taken that, that phone number and service all around the world and so I didn't have a whole lot of blackout spots and that sort of thing but so we're in the middle of nowhere and driving down the road all I see is green and concrete and that's it um, and my phone rings and it's one of my aunties and, and she asked you know well where am I and I said well I'm driving and whatever and she says well you know I just want to let you know that um, Lamar I'll go ahead and call us in he's deceased now Lamar's in the hospital and, and they're not expecting him to make it and I knew immediately that's why my spirit told me to go home. Because this particular person had been very instrumental in my life. He was a second cousin. And we close in age, so we kind of grew up together. We did a lot of partying, a lot of firsts, the second, thirds. Uh, and he was, we, we were very close. He was a big cheerleader of mine. I was a big cheerleader of his. Regardless of how he lived his life. And I intend to do a video on um, some of the things he struggled with at some point but um he was down and you know he wasn't able to reach out to me himself until someone else did and by the grace of god if you will i um i was obedient and so i was already on the road halfway there and he you know been taken to the hospital he was taken that day as as a matter of fact when i was getting the inkling to go he was being transported to the hospital then um, and so I went and, and I was able to, I did not see him before he passed. Uh, I was struggling with parking and all that other stuff. And by the time I was walking inside the door to the hospital, hospital another cousin um, was coming through and she said, you know, it, he, he just, he's gone. He just, and she said she couldn't stay there for it. He'd just taken his last breath. And so I missed it maybe by about five or ten minutes, so if that long. Um, but still to be in that room, uh, in the environment, and, and be able to spend a few minutes with him was, was awesome to me. Um, another experience of following my spirit. When I lived on the East Coast, my Thanksgiving tradition was I spent in the country with my country adopted family, and I spent Christmas in New York with my biological family. And this had been for years, a good 10, 15 years. That was the, the routine that I had. And um, the people in the country, my adopted family, as well as my um, the elders in my biological family, always expected me to come around for Thanksgiving. They knew I'd be coming in. And he, the, the, the uncles would have that um, thick skin fried bacon and the grits that had just enough lump in them to... To, to be unique to, to him, my Uncle Levy, and um, the eggs scrambled with the salt and pepper in it, just, just, you know, country breakfast, fresh biscuits, and all that other good stuff. He'd have it for me as soon as I'm rolling in, no matter if I came at 11 o'clock at night, he would just be, have fixed this food fresh for me when I got in. But um, anyway, this particular year, at the last minute, I rerouted. I was packed and I was ready. I was headed down to the country and 
something just said, nope, go north. And, and I know it was, it was the spirit. But um, I rerouted, and I didn't call anybody. I didn't tell anybody. I just rerouted my turn, my car around, and I headed north. And I made it north. Um, and you know, everyone was surprised, et cetera, et cetera. And as it turned out, that particular year, my brother um, had, you know, been um, not spending so much time with the family for the holidays and stuff. And he showed up that year. One of my brothers. I've got seven brothers and four sisters, and this one particular brother had been a bit distanced for, um, if you know my story, then you'll kind of understand why, but um, he showed up, and that was like, you know, the icing on the cake, and um, we, he and I have a picture to this day uh, in my grandmother's living room from that particular Thanksgiving that we met up at home, but um, the significance of that is that was the last Thanksgiving that we saw my grandmother alive. That's the last Thanksgiving that we spent with her. Uh, she was able to get up out of the bed and sit in her chair in the in the front room. That front room with the plastic on the furniture that we're only allowed in on the holidays when everybody comes. Yeah, we were all in that room. And that's where she was sitting in her chair. And by now I'm an adult, so I could sit in the front room. The little kids have to go in the back, but I can sit in the front room. But we were all in the front room just fellowshipping and hanging out and enjoying each other's company and stuff. Um, but it was just awesome because I hadn't seen my brother in a while. Um, and I don't usually see my grandmother for Thanksgiving. And here, just following my spirit, I wound up doing what? Getting my grandmother for the, her very last Thanksgiving as well as seeing my brother. And I remember he and I we were looking at Grandma. Because we used to call her Mama. She she actually was very instrumental in raising us in our younger years as well. Um, but And then we got older and we decided she was Grandma and not Mama. Um, and he and I looked at each other. And um, someone had commented once before about how we have this bond to where we can look and we can kind of read each other's minds. And so we read each other's minds and both of us knew that... Um, her her end on this earth and in, in this body, in her, in her current body at the time, her then current body, was near. And we didn't have to say it, we just knew it. And so, you know, we kind of hugged on her and loved on her and took pictures and all that other good stuff. And, and you know, those pictures are prominently displayed now. Um, and so, again, I'm giving you examples of why it's important to follow your spirit. You never want to be in position where oh, dang, I should have, and as we say, something told me, or my spirit told me, or my intuition told me, but I didn't listen. No, you want to do it. Go ahead and follow it. Um, yet again, my grandmother, my biological grandmother on my father's side, who was in the Virgin Islands, in maybe about two years before she passed, I had um, a sudden inkling, middle of the week, to see her and um, I looked at my budget my budget couldn't really afford the trip that week I was gonna have to make it another paycheck or two or, or try to pull some money from my IRA and you know take the hit with the I with IRS and the taxes and all that other kind of good stuff and I don't want to do that and so I wanted to try to wait it out until I could pull the money straight out of my check and not, not affect any of my savings but it just rolled on me so for the first time in my life, I made up some story to my boss. I, I can't remember what I told him, but I made up a story. And I booked a flight. I paid probably three times what, you know, it would have cost had I planned it seven, 14 days in advance. But I didn't care. I just knew I had to go see my granny. And so I went down. Um, I flew down. It turned out it was during Carnival. And so my granny was shocked because I wasn't trying to go do any of the Carnival activities. She did eventually convince me to go out with my Auntie Nelly to um, something. I can't remember what it was we went to. Just, you know, kind of hanging out or whatever down at the square. Or was it at the ballpark? Wherever we were, we went out one night. But the other time that I was there, I sat pretty much up under her, at her feet, just sucking up everything about her, just um, enjoying her hair, her her face, her, her sewing. She was a, a, a well-esteemed seamstress. Uh, watching her cook, um, getting some recipes, um, just getting all the pearls that she had to offer. 
um, and that was just, I spent a week there, and I, that was just time, most of it was just me and her. She fixed lunch for everybody, I mean, she cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner, up until she physically could not do it. No matter how old you were, I remember my Uncle Paul, who, you know, at that point had three grown children, and he would come home for lunch every day to Granny's, and Granny would have lunch freshly made, um, some fresh fried fish, and Johnny Cake, and, and, you know, who knows whatever else she's thrown in there with it. Um, but just to watch her dope that kind of love upon her family, even in those years, was instrumental to me. Because it guided me in how to treat my family, my kids. Um, and I continue to just follow in the spirit. That's that's what you want to do. When your spirit talks to you, as long as you remain as... as um, good-hearted, uh, detoxed as much as possible, and in commune with whomever your higher God is, then um, it will be easier for you to hear, it will be easier for you to um, discern or to feel, if you will, your spirit talking to you. And you want to follow it because it's guiding you. If um, if it's telling you to do something, then, then you'll be able to get the message quicker or more quickly and be able to act more quickly. So even in the marriage that, you know, those of you who know that I'm dealing with right now, uh, most people that know me know certain things I wouldn't tolerate. And I'd walk away from real quick, fast, and in a hurry. But my spirit said, nope, uh-uh, don't do it. Um, there's more to this story and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, in the process of following my spirit, I have to endure the ridicule and all of that kind of stuff of, you know, there are some people who say, oh, the man just doesn't want you and he's, you know, he's just not into you and he just wants to leave, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, most of them don't know the details of things. They don't know the sequence of things. They don't know um, where he is medically and the impact uh, or where his brain is. They don't know the um, the influence, the mind control or brainwashing, if you will, that he's been subjected to through our cult and those people who sought to um, to exhaust the resources. Uh, so, of course, they would say that. But once you know the full gamut of the background, then you can kind of understand why I chose the path that I chose. But either way, my spirit said no, and so I'm following that. Um, I continue to pray for, oh, well, well, while we're on the marriage, I'll just say, even with that, I remember praying very heavily um, for guidance because the type of person I am, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, I'm out. I'm done. I'm, I'm you know, see ya. I've got to do me. What's happening right now is not in my best interest. It doesn't feel good. I don't like it. I'm gone. Um, and in my praying, just, you know, for, for guidance to, to do it the best way, um, my spirit slapped me all across my face, forward slap, back slap, up slap, down slap, you name the slaps, I was getting slapped all inside my face. And it was very hard, it was very immediate, it was very, um, strong, it was, it was, um, kind of the strongest, if you will. I could say probably the almost the most strongest I've ever felt. And um, that made me stop right then and there in my tracks and take note. And so I said, okay, what is it you're trying to tell me? What, what is it do I need to know? What do I, what do I need to be doing? And um, I heard in my ear, do not separate. I do not want y'all separated. You all are to, or you're destined to be together. Um, and in my spirit, I'm responding, yeah, but things ain't going right, and this is not, you know, kind of what I signed up for, et cetera, et cetera. And it came before I could get it out. The word orchestrated dropped in my head, or in my spirit, if you will. And it, it, it the drop was so heavy to where I couldn't deny it. So I'm like, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll orchestrate it, orchestrate it, orchestrate it. And it was just so, it's almost like a gong orchestrated. It was just so strong and heavy. And I said, okay, well, you know what? If it's orchestrated and, and we're not supposed to separate, we're supposed to strengthen, we're supposed to get through this, then um, 
who orchestrated it? You know, orchestrated by who? And um, there was a law for a moment. And so, and, and at that point, my husband had said something. So we started talking and we kind of, I kind of got away from it. And within, I'd say, 15 minutes of us talking, two names and faces from that church well, two names popped in my head, and at the same time the names are popping in, the faces are coming across my vision, my eyes, like inside my head, but, you know, kind of, I can see their faces. And, um, and my spirit is telling me, yeah, it's orchestrated by these people. These are the ringleaders. And I'm like, wow, wow. As it turns out, these leaders um, are leaders, if you will. And um, they're both people who I had not initially suspected would um, actually take measures because they, you know, come across as so Christian and so into everything and all of that other good stuff and doing right um, and running a marriage ministry and things like that. It never occurred to me that they would be the ones that are, you know, advocating for the destruction of my marriage. Uh, and, uh, but that weighed on me and I shared one of them with my husband at the moment. Um, and then he said something that just reconfirmed one of them right then and there on the spot. And I said, you see what you just said? And I gave him, actually, he's told me something that one of them had said. And I told him, I said, well, that's strange. Cause when I talked to them, they told me this. And I said, well, see honey. And, and so I kind of gave him the spill of what my spirit was saying to me. And I could see the wheels kind of turning in him. And he's like, wait a minute. He's getting mad at this point. He's kind of getting mad that he's feeling like he's, he's being played. Um, but I said, okay, well, you know, we'll just, let's, let's just see. Let's, let's, you know, we've got to be more in prayer with this thing and, and kind of see what it is and how we're going to handle it and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I did not hear my spirit say was have no more contact with them. And so I didn't share that with my husband. And so he continued to have contact with them. And he probably even confronted them about some things because after that, he became more adamantly against having, you know, to talk about it at all. He, anytime it came up, he was, he would like try to dog me out. It's like he would defend them till the end type of thing. Um, and which I thought was mighty, mighty strange. But, you know, now here this far into it, I see mind control, manipulation, witchcraft, all that kind of stuff. That's the way it operates. Once the target, which was my husband at that point, I was the target to be eliminated. He was the target to be um, drained and, and, and exploited. Once the target is beginning to come out of whatever the trance or the spell or whatever it is, or once they start coming into the knowledge that something is wrong, you have to they have to step up the, the tactics. And so they stepped up the taxi, tactics really heavy to keep us apart at whatever cost. And it didn't matter what the cost was. Um, and so I get that. Uh, but again, the point there was to follow your spirit. And in following my spirit, I was able to see, and during the, in this journey, I'm able to see as well as look back at specific things and see step by step the various things that were done. And there were a multitude of things done, a multitude of things said with specific intent to cause discord between he and I. Um, things that very clearly showed him um, being a total opposite of the person he had been previously. Uh, and this is not like injury from his, his you know, accident. Uh, because we had done some, you know, the doctors had done some testing and I had um, consulted with, with psychotherapist people and all of that to um, learn all about the condition and, and how it would operate and, and those sorts of things. So this wasn't that. What he did get from that injury was the inability to um, to analyze stuff that's being put in front of him so well, and the inability to um, fight off or to learn the difference between good and bad, if you will, uh, and and that's that's oversimplifying it. But he just he he couldn't think so far in advance, 
before I could go to him and say something that he could think what I said in that moment and think three weeks, three, three months down the road, the impact of that. Well, now that he's had his injury, he can think in the moment and maybe a couple days beyond. Going six months down the road, he's not, you know, really able to think the impact that far. And so, um, and they knew that that was his vulnerability. And so they targeted him when he was vulnerable. Um, and as I continue on this journey of exposing the, or not exposing, but sharing my journey, I continue to see things that have been done and not just to, to, you know, to our marriage, but to the other marriages. And, um, as it gets more challenging, as uh, the the what's the word I want to say, the um, actors become more um, baffled, not baffled, as they scramble more to cover their tracks. Um, and I pray, and I'm asking, okay, do I need to continue in this? What my spirit says to me is, nope, continue in it. Continue. Be uh, more detailed. Be more specific. Be more um, not necessarily aggressive and not assertive, but my spirit is saying, no, you're not doing enough. Um, my spirit is saying um, lives have been affected. Lives continue to be affected. And if I don't follow through, then many more lives will be affected. So um, I continue to do it. Um, and one of the last examples I wanted to give was... Uh, in my health journey, back to that health journey again, I remember 17, 18 years ago, well, closer to 20 years ago, the first thing the doctors said was, oh, it's just anxiety. Um, and that's the catch-all that they give to women with any kind of issue. Or you've got depression, anxiety, you know, one of those two. It's always that when it comes to women. Or your hormonal, your hormones are off. That's, you know, what they give to women. And I thought about it, and I said, well, yeah, but still, I'm still just not, because again, in my spirit, it wasn't, that wasn't sitting right with me. Um, then they said at one point, I think about 15 years ago, well, it's menopause. And I said, well, okay. And I thought about it, and I said, well, at this age, that, that's not normal. And said, well, yeah, some people have menopause early, so I said, all right. And I went home, I toyed with it, and then my, it didn't sit right in my spirit, so I kept pushing. Um, then I got a, a mental, I think two or three mental diagnoses or something. I think it was depression. It was, uh, some, some, I don't even remember what it was, but some kind of mental diagnoses. And I said, okay, you know what? Then, you know, I, I can work. At least I've got something because the menopause and the, the anxiety hormone stuff wasn't working. So at least I've got something else. But I think after a week or so of me kind of toying with that, that didn't sit right. My spirit would not accept it. it. It just rejected it. Even to, I tried to tell myself, well, this is what it is. And so we've got to learn it and work with it. My spirit rejected it all the way around, would not accept. So um, as I continued on um, and, and as I go into my health series and you'll learn the specifics uh, as things you know became more severe, I wound up finding out that I was being misdiagnosed, not just with those things, but it continued to misdiagnose. And then all those misdiagnoses, I was given a whole bunch of different medicines, medicines that conflicted with each other, that conflicted with my body, that conflicted with the very um, condition that I had from the beginning, um, and just kind of creating a, a great big old mess. Um, but my spirit would not, you know, Everything that they were giving me, my spirit was not resting in. The only thing, only time my spirit could halfway rest is when it was heavily medicated and it was unfunctioning right. Uh, but again, when I started cleansing, detoxing regularly and coming off of some of those meds, my spirit man was kicking up again and it was saying, nope, 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 nope. It would not let me rest in whatever the diagnoses were. And so I was able to, in that process, go outside of the insurance and pay out of pocket for doctors, get some testing done. Uh, I even took myself to the mental hospital and told them, you know, hey, I'm crazy, uh, so help me figure it out. And, you know, those people kind of, they didn't laugh at me, but they, you know, kind of looked at me like, woman, if you don't get yourself out of here, ain't nothing wrong with you. Um, 
and you know offered to help me and actually as it turns out the doctor looked took one look at me and told me my diagnosis and when I told him yeah I am I do have that condition and I'm taking my medicine and it's well maintained and he said no it's not because if it well if it were well maintained you would not have the symptoms that you continue to have and he says, I said, well, can you just diagnose something, whatever, just whatever the mental part of it is, just give me that so at least I've got that out the way I can check that off my list. And he looks at me and says, you don't understand. If your condition is not maintained properly, you're going to look like you have a host of other conditions. And if you don't have a trained eye doctor who knows what he's looking for, then you will get railroaded into all these conditions that you don't have and you're never going to get well. And so that my spirit accepted. I didn't know how to process all of it at the moment, but my spirit rested in that sentence that he gave me. And I said, okay, so what do I do? And of course, you know, he offered to, to help me. Um, and I wound up not uh, using uh, his help just because of there were some logistics to it. And that'll come in the, in the health journey part. But um, bottom line, follow your spirit. Had I not followed my spirit, I would never have made it to this one doctor in, um, I don't even know the name of the hospital. It was a mental hospital, whatever was on my insurance at the time. Uh, and that was the first doctor to stand up and say, everything you'd been told prior is crap and it's a lie. You've been misdiagnosed. You've got lazy doctors who took the first symptom and just gave you something, a bunch of pills, gave you a diagnosis, billed your insurance, and kept you coming back, and you're not getting any better. And um, that's what set me really, really on my health journey, having that armed, knowing that, no, my stuff is not mental. I knew it was not menopause because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this stuff every month, so it's not menopause. Uh, I knew there was some bit of anxiety, but that's part of the condition, but it wasn't the anxiety that, you know, doctors tried to put it on. The arthritis, the carpal tunnel, the, the, just, I, I won't even get into all of the conditions because that's in the, the health segment that I want to do. Um, but all of those things that they were giving me weren't mine. And had I just accepted them and forced my spirit to accept them, I would have been doing myself a disservice and I probably would have shut down the ability to work with my spirit or to hear from my spirit or to, to feel from my spirit because I would have been grieving my spirit. You know, it's sitting here trying to tell me, hey, 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 something's wrong and that ain't it. And I'm sitting here telling him or telling it, give it a, a gender, telling it, the doctor said this and this is what we must accept. So. I say all that to say, follow your spirit. Um, if you are destined to rise, you can't be held down forever. If something is going on in your life and you've got all kinds of mayhem coming from every darn direction and your spirit says stand, then you stand. If you've got, as in my case, a group who has been, um, you know, that, that I've talked about. And, and I've shared my experiences with that group, and they may not—they're not necessarily in a, a reflecting that group in a positive light. So if you've got a group targeting you and using um, under the auspices of, of the person that they've manipulated and controlled his mind, using him as the front runner uh, and trying to twist it off and kind of get themselves dissociated as much as possible so it looks like the issue is just he and I when it's really them and they're pushing him up to do all of this stuff or they, they're controlling him, they're the puppet masters. Um, if you've got a group at your back and your spirit says stand, says don't run or it says fight back, whatever your spirit is telling you to do, you follow it because your spirit wants what's best for you and your spirit knows in the long run they can't hold you down forever. Well, it can't hold you down. If you have um, an issue, let's say your boss at work is steady telling you, no, you, you don't have what it takes to be promoted to manager. But in your spirit, you know you do. Your spirit is telling you every day, I'm going to be manager. I'm manager material. I'm manager material. You stand on that. 
Let your boss say every day, no, you're not manager material. And when he says it, your spirit is rejecting it and you reject it. And you say, okay. And you go on and you do your little work. And then when you walk away from him, you align yourself with your spirit. You're right. I am manager material. May not be at this location, but I am manager material. And it's destined for me. And this boss may be trying to hold me down, but he can't hold me forever. I will get there. And you continue in that. Sometimes the road, as you guys know my life story, is not necessarily easy getting there. And sometimes we take detours. Sometimes we miss our signals and, and miss our turns, if you will. And sometimes the road is intentionally rocky and um, winding and all that other good stuff with planned detours because there are some pearls of wisdom that we need to catch along the way of all those planned detours. There are some extra skills we need to build as we're climbing those rocks on that road. But you will get there as long as you continue to follow your spirit. So um, I say all that to say, continue to follow your spirit no matter what. Do not be derailed. Um, and if you feel like you've been derailed, get yourself somewhere. If you've got to go to the country, to the beach, to the ocean, um, if you've got to go sit in your attic, get your fan because it's usually hot up there. Go sit in your attic by yourself so you can't be interrupted by anybody or anything. Leave the cell phone, you know, downstairs and you sit there and you just meditate all by yourself and try to commune with your spirit. Try to commune with your God. Try to become one with those. You're going to get the information that you need. You're going to get the guidance that you need. And then you're going to have the comfort and the peace to do it no matter what is thrown your way. And um, on a, from a Christian perspective, they they call that the grace. Um, and, and it's so strange, grace. I think someone, one of those leaders had called me and said, well, you know what? You just need to um, let your husband go and just pray for grace to let him go. And then this person knows only maybe 10% of the story. And they're going based on what they're being told by the by the group, of course. And so I think it's mighty strange because that grace just came up and what that leader said to me just popped in my head about grace. Well, no, I, I've not prayed for grace to um, to dissolve the marriage or whatever the case may be, uh, only because that's not what my spirit has told me to do. My spirit has told me to pray for grace or to pray for guidance in what I should be doing. I've not told it what it is I want to do. I'm allowing it to tell me what it is I should be doing. And that makes the difference. From a Christian standpoint, what do they tell you? You don't go to God with your plans. You let God give you his plan. So, um, you know, I give it to those Christians. I'm not going to God with my plan, my man-made plan, or the man-made plan that the puppeteers are trying to hand down. I'm going to God and I'm saying, God, okay, what's your plan? You tell me your plan, and I might not like it. I might have to roll up my sleeves and kind of get dirty getting it done. But tell me your plan, because I want to do what's best for me. And you're my God, then I trust that you know what's best for me. So, um, say all that to say, remember the detoxes. Uh, when I get to the health segment, you know a little bit more about them. But again, if um, you can find a whole bunch of things on the internet. Uh, try to stay with the more um, organic stuff, the more, um, uh, what do I want to say, the more natural stuff as you're searching the internet for your detoxes. Um, stay away from, at this point, I would say if you don't have any experience in it, any background in it, and you don't know the strength of your health, then I would say just deal with, um, you know, the natural fruit and vegetable type of detoxes. Uh and stay away from any uh, supplements that, that say detox. Uh, the only one I personally recommend, like I said, is the CKLS because the colon, and CKLS stands for colon, kidney, liver, and spleen. Those are three um, organs in your body that their purpose is to cleanse. It, their purpose is to detox your blood and, and, and your lymph, lymph, lymphatic fluids and all that other kind of stuff. So they're already pulling the crap out of your bloodstream. So they're going to get 
a lot of the crap that's floating through your blood anyway. It's going to sit there with them. Um, and not necessarily the solid stuff, because we know the solid stuff passes through your intestines, but more the um, the the chemical stuff or the, the cellular stuff. They're getting all of that. And they get full too. They get full. And if you your system has been off for whatever reason, they're not being cleaned properly either. So the CKLS is going to help to target cleaning them and flushing them out so that they're able to pull more crud and crap out of your bloodstream. Um, that being the case, let me know what you think. If you've got any questions, comments, uh, specifics, drop them in the comment box below and um, I'll try to respond to them. Um, but again, follow your spirit because that's your spirit and this is your life. All the puppeteers around you, mama, daddy, pastor, best friend, husband, wife, dog, kids, boss, next door neighbor, none of them were given the life to live that you were given. It's your life and it's your spirit and your relationship with your spirit, your relationship with, with your God, whomever your God may be, and you're walking that out will determine you reaching the destinies that are that are um, waiting for you, no matter who tries to hold you down, no matter what tries to hold you down. So, that being the case, uh, be well, follow your spirit, cleanse, detox, study, meditate, commune, all those other good things that you've got to do so that you can get back in line, and then just listen. Just listen. If it comes by way of a phone call, like I said, you may get it reading the newspaper that we rarely even do these days. It may be just something that drops in. You can hear it audibly in your ear. You can feel it in your gut. Um, it may be, and I've had situations where it rings in my ear like a song that won't shut up. Um, so, you know, just whatever works for you, whatever, however it comes to you, follow it. Be obedient to it. Even if it means not being obedient to some man or woman, elder, pastor, mama, or whomever else. Now, obviously, if your spirit is telling you to break the law, to kill somebody, to, you know, go shoot up the bank or some craziness like that, you might need to check and see if you're actually cleansed enough and if you've got some sin or, or some issues or something going on that's got you listening to a wrong spirit. But oftentimes... Um, when we do all those other things, we have a good heart and we've cleansed and that sort of thing, we will align with, with the right spirit. And um, that spirit will, will indwell in us and help us to get where it is we need to go. So be blessed and um, see you next time.